Now on Radio 4, we've the touching story of a disabled student and her struggle to play music. Josie Darby presents Charlotte White's Musical Fight. <laughs> In 2008, a video clip appeared on the internet of a teenage girl performing the prelude to Bach's cello suite. Nothing remarkable about this, you may think, until you learn that the musician, Charlotte White, was playing every crotchet and quaver using only the slightest movements of her head and thumbs. This performance proved to be a defining moment in Charlotte's rehabilitation, but it also raised questions about how musical talent and achievement are assessed, questions that have yet to be answered. Well, I'm just arriving at the home of Charlotte, which is in a small village in Buckinghamshire, where I'm going to meet her and her mother and just find out how much music has actually changed their lives. Charlotte, when did you first start playing music? When I was about six years old, I had regular piano lessons like all my friends did at school. Were you having examinations? I never did exams. My mum wanted us to play for fun rather than play to achieve something. In those early days, did you enjoy doing the piano? Were you, were you loving it? Not particularly. It was more something I did because we were all expected to do it. I didn't start enjoying music till later on in life. So can I ask you just to go back to your accident, really? Would you be able to tell us what happened? When I was 11 years old, um, I used to ride a lot. I competed on a pony. And for a period of a year, I constantly fell off my pony for no apparent reason. The last time I was in in the stable yard holding my rabbit and guinea pig, and I fell over backwards and hit my head. And everything went downhill from there. And what was the diagnosis back then? Did, was it something that they expected you to recover from? Or what did they tell you was, what had happened? I don't have a full diagnosis. I've got diagnoses which cover some of my problems, but not all of my problems. They're constantly finding new things out, even now, 11 years on. And not surprisingly, this had huge consequences on Charlotte's quality of life. For a long period of time, my life had been about exercise, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and that was it. That was drummed into me day in, day out, day in. And all I was expected to do was achieve and get physically stronger, which wasn't happening a lot of the time. So that was quite depressing that I was doing all this work and not getting much out of it. And that was the only life I knew. A lot of my friends had moved on by then. They were having fun at school, enjoying life, where I was just having physio, physio, physio. I'd only see physios, I'd only see speech therapists, I'd only see people who were meant to, like, make my life better and improvement, but it never seemed to happen. After the accident, Charlotte gradually lost all movement in her body. She spent five years in and out of hospital and eventually went into a period of rehabilitation, regaining movement in her head and then gradually her fingers. At 16, Charlotte began attending St Rose's School in Stroud. It was there that she was introduced to the Drake Music Project, an organisation that uses technology to help people with disabilities participate in music. Doug came up and I had the option of a cooking class or going to meet Doug and seeing what Drake music was about. But did you think back to your piano days at six and think, "Mm, I have a feel for music? Did you know that you had a feel? Uh, When I became disabled, I was introduced to music therapy Music therapy is literally someone sitting in front of you banging a drum or playing a guitar and you're meant to tell them all your worries about life or you're meant to be really happy because someone's banging a drum in your face. And what, you found that patronising or what? Incredibly patronising and very boring and completely pointless. And I expected the Drake to be like that, but it wasn't at all. The Drake music gave you the opportunity to play independently 
rather than just sitting there listening like a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> and did that affect your attitude towards it? Tell me about the very first lessons. At the time, I had a huge sensitivity to light, therefore I wore dark glasses and spent a lot of time in a sort of half-lit room playing music and Doug getting me to interact with him to begin with and then learning the basics and chords and beats. We listened to a lot of Robbie Williams. Was that educational or...? (laughs) It became educational. (laughs) Very surprisingly. (laughs) We were working one-to-one in the dark, very quietly, because at the time she was very sensitive to light. So the only light in the room was the glare off my laptop screen. And the music we were playing was so quiet that actually the whir of the fan on the laptop was almost louder than the music at points. Doug Bott was the first person to work with Charlotte to create music. Sitting on the table, we have what we call a magic arm. It's a piece of equipment which can fix any piece of technology in just about any position around a person's body. And attached by Velcro to this arm is a fairly unspectacular looking black rectangular box, which is a magnetic motion sensor. So it emits a small magnetic field and you can assign pretty much anything that you want to that magnetic field. So in in Charlotte's case, we assigned about seven or eight notes to it and she was able to make very small head movements in order to play those musical notes. Then she had one switch, very small switch on each thumb. One of those switches did a very simple task, which was to turn the sound that she was playing on and off, so that if she wanted to move her head without playing music, she could. The other switch, controlled with her other thumb, changed the configuration of notes available to her on the motion sensor that she was playing with her head. So to liken this to playing a guitar, it's as if the right hand that a guitarist would normally use to finger pick the notes, to pick out the individual notes. It's as if the right hand was her head moving in and out of the motion sensor to pick the notes. And then the guitarist's left hand, which changes the chord shapes on the fretboard of the guitar, the role of the left hand was taken by the switch that Charlotte was using to change the configuration of notes available to be played by her head. What was your first impression of Charlotte? Um, My first impressions, uh, somebody who was interested in classical music, which not many of the young people I was working with at the time were, somebody who was interested very much in working on her own, in her own way. So yeah, the, the early sessions were very much about finding out what she was interested in and also how physically and practically she was going to create music, perform it, learn about it, compose it. At what point did you think she's got something special? Hmm. I think it was just before, a few weeks before the first time she actually performed in public. I'd been very careful not to put too much pressure on her to move forward and to achieve. I was very happy for her to go at her own pace. But she knew there was a concert coming up in school and she announced that she wanted to be a part of that, that she wanted to perform in it. Given the rate at which we'd been working in the previous months, I was a bit nervous because I didn't really think that she would be able to get the piece together in time to be able to perform it. But she did. She really knuckled down and applied herself and practised an awful lot outside of our sessions which was quite a thing because the equipment that she was using at the time, I wasn't able to leave it in school. So when she was practising by herself, she was doing it entirely in her own head and making the movements from memory without the equipment. So yeah, that's when I realised she had, she had something special because the music it was in her head. That was very scary. I was outside waiting to go on. Like, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. And Doug was like, yes, yes, you are. It's like, no, I'm not. It's like, 
just calm down, relax. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. Like, you're not meant to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I got on stage and Doug came on with me because I wanted him there. And I performed it in front of everyone and I, I felt really shaky and nervous. So I've never performed in front of people before then. And it went reasonably well, I think. And the piece came out maybe a bit too fast, but it went well enough. Everyone seemed to enjoy it, and quite a few people were surprised, I think. Did you have family and friends in the audience? My aunt was there, and my mum. And for Charlotte's mum, Tessa, seeing her daughter's transformation was nothing short of remarkable. It was fantastic, actually. Really, really good. She um, had been through such a, a rotten time, and it just gave her something which she could achieve and it was just wonderful as a mother to see her um, doing so. I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's stupid. It's ages ago as well. <laughs> it gave her something which she could achieve and be successful at. And as a parent, it was just wonderful to see that the determination she had actually... It was successful, and yeah, she was good at it. <laughs> so it was really good. How do you think music changed Charlotte's life? Um, I think it was the achievement of being able to play, performing another in front of people was, I think, incredibly nerve-wracking for Charlotte. So the fact that she managed to do it gave her a lot of confidence, which I think also then helped in other spheres of her life, sort of academically and um, probably socially as well. And I just think it's helped her realise that she can achieve anything she wants to. She puts her mind to it. Relative to your memories of playing the piano, playing music in this way, does it feel similar, if that makes any sense? I think it was very different. I practised a lot. I don't really remember practising much when I played the piano. I enjoyed it. I wanted to achieve at it because it made people see me as a person rather than a disabled person who they made presumptions about. First it about Charlotte, when uh, Jonathan Westrup from Drake posted a video clip of Charlotte playing on the Teaching Music website. David Ashworth is a freelance educational consultant who specialises in music and technology. The performance was significant because, well, there were two things. One was it showed someone who obviously had uh, severe disabilities but was actually able to overcome those to play a standard piece of repertoire, and I'd never seen that before. How did it compare in relation to, say, a traditional cellist? Well, that's interesting. I mean, if you were to listen just the audio you would find Charlotte's performance is wanting. I mean, the quality of the sound, the phrasing, the timing that you get with a professional musician playing a real cello, and the, the, all the expressive qualities is in a league of its own. Then you hear, you hear what Charlotte's doing, and it, it's nowhere near the same level. However, when you watch the video clip and see what she's doing, it then becomes very powerful, and it makes you realise that actually music is more about listening, it's more about the whole contextual thing, if you like. And, well, not just me, but other commentators who've been on the website, seen the clip and left comments, have found it's a, a deeply moving experience hearing someone play a piece of Bach in that way. There is an argument that Charlotte's performance is akin to being given a keyboard with only the right notes on it. How would you react to that? That's an interesting one. In, in fact, there are conventional instruments, if you like, only have the right notes. But in fact, it, it's a bigger thing than that. I think right notes is only part of the picture. We tend to get obsessed with people playing the right notes. You know, the, the, the pitches of the notes becomes all important. But there's far more to music than the actual pitches of the notes that you play and what was so interesting about Charlotte's performance was that you could see you could witness that the mental and physical engagement and also the musical engagement as well and well the spiritual engagement if you like and and that was the powerful thing to me so just to reduce music to a conversation about how you access the right pitches of the notes is only part of the picture you look at that clip of Charlotte and what's really the most powerful bit for me is that right at the end when she stops playing the moments pause and then she she breaks into a, a big, broad grin. And you know, she knows she's, she's made something musically significant. There. She's achieved something musically significant there.
The principle behind the way that we use assistive music technology is almost the opposite to a conventional musical instrument. So with a conventional musical instrument, the instrument itself is fixed and the musician has to master that instrument and has to almost subordinate themselves to the demands of that instrument. Whereas what assistive music technology does is to take a person and their particular interests, their physical needs, and create a musical instrument, a way of playing music, which is absolutely right for that person, not just physically and musically, but also in terms of ensuring that there's an appropriate challenge. Where does the technology end and the skill of the musician begin? Mm, That's a very difficult question to answer. It um, completely depends upon the individual musician, but I could probably answer that in, in terms of conventional musical instruments. If you take a piano, for example, um, there are all kinds of elements of a piano which are already assistive. The keys are ordered on the keyboard from low to high. They're tuned according to a convention, equal temperament. They're tuned at concert pitch. I dare say that if you went into a music exam, having prepared all your piano pieces, and the examiner was to tell you, oh, by the way, today, in order to um, test you a little bit further, we've rearranged all of the notes on the piano keyboard and retuned it. Um, But if you're a good pianist, then you should be able to handle that. That gives maybe some kind of an impression. All, All musical instruments are assistive in some way because they are set up in a certain way. The difference with assistive music technology is that it varies from person to person. It's set up so the sound starts working about there, so that distance. You can change the distance at which it starts actually triggering. You can make it trigger from here onwards, so you can do something quite big, or you can do something very small. So as I'm pulling away from the device, and as I move my hand further away, it plays up the scale. Jonathan Westrup from Drake Music demonstrated some of the technology they use at St Rose's School in Stroud. The actual device itself looks like a small red torch and it emits an invisible beam and when you break the beam with any part of your body or whatever it'll trigger sound and you can set up what that sound is. So at the moment we've got a a cello here which we could just play a little bit. I'm just moving my hand now in front of it so you can hear now that's a scale. Students got a very wide motion. For example, if they can swing their left arm, you know, that's a big movement they've got, then it can still pick up the sound rather than, you know, the small fine motor movements, which other students might want to use different equipment, but that's quite good for big movements. It does take as much time to master as any other instrument, really, because then, like you're finding, you need to kind of find, if you want to find a little riff there, I'm not a master by any means. Aileen Skugdal runs music classes for disabled students in the Norwegian city of Tromsø. Their Arctic winters are long and dark, and in January the city celebrates the end of the polar nights with a large cultural festival. Having seen Charlotte perform, Aileen invited her to compose music for the festival. It's the darkest period in Tromsø where we, when we have no sun. So it's also a way of making life to the city, having a big music festival with musicians coming from all over the world. And, and it's, it's all kinds of music being performed there, from big symphony orchestras to small jazz ensembles and rock bands in the evenings. And so it's a very diverse music festival. And can you describe how her compositions were performed? Before the performance, it was quite a long project with months of her composing and sending files to Norway, speaking on phone about what we wanted with the music and how it should fit with the dancers. And Charlotte was also very clear on she wanted acoustic instruments. So we had musicians from the Symphony Orchestra of Tromsø to do a recording of her music. The performance at the Northern Light Music Festival was outdoor in uh, minus 10. This was on the town square of Tromsø and and it was packed with people around there. And the scene was made up by ice and snow sculptures 
and they had proper lighting and and dancers dancing to the music. So it was it was really it was quite magic to hear the music in that setting. I really wanted to pursue grades. I wanted to pursue music at college, but unfortunately establishments who grade musicians wouldn't recognise it. Examining boards wouldn't recognise it. And therefore, I couldn't progress. Do you understand why they won't recognise it? Do you think that's fair? They're very traditional in the way they recognise any examination. And therefore, the way the Drake Music and students play music is very different. And they even need to set up a separate examination which can be qualified at the same level, which is specifically for music technology, or they need to accept it. We're meant to be an equal society, therefore everyone should be equally graded. Charlotte's achievements were recognised when she received a Bronze Arts Award from Trinity College London. In a statement, Trinity College go on to say, Although there is no specific campaign to encourage the use of assistive technology, we have taken great interest in Charlotte's achievement and profiled her story both on our website and in other print materials and press articles. We hope that this has actively encouraged others working with assistive technology to see how Arts Award could work for them. The music examining boards are consistent in their approach in as far as they don't accredit music performed electronically. But as Doug Bott explains, it's early days. If Charlotte had come to us in 20 years' time, then I would fully expect that she would have been able to have had her achievements accredited either through the the formal school music curriculum or through instrumental exams whether that's through the associated board of the royal schools of music or anyone else at the moment it's it's very new territory for everybody i think there are young disabled people who have their achievements accredited in various ways but one issue which i think people tend to shy away from talking about um, but which i'm quite happy to talk about is that there's a very big issue around the nature of people's different disabilities. So differently disabled people access music in different ways. And some of those means of access, whether it's through Braille music or whether it's through British Sign Language, some of those means of access are perhaps more able to slot in to the existing accreditation frameworks. Other forms of access for example, assistive music technology, which is particularly useful for people who face physical barriers to music, these means of access haven't really been tried and tested yet. We're talking a fair bit at the moment to the Associated Board and they're quite open about the fact that currently they don't accredit any kind of music produced electronically, let alone the kind of assistive technology that our students are using but they're very keen to engage with these kinds of developments and what we're currently in the very early stages of discussing with them and also colleagues at Bath Spa University are ways that you can accredit the quality of a musical performance in such a way that it's not necessarily linked to the particular instrument that a person is playing. But what we're arguing for is something which, to play devil's advocate, takes it even further and says, OK, but what if you were to turn up to a piano exam to play the piano repertoire and you were to say, actually, I'm not going to play it on a piano today, I'm going to play it on a flute. How would you examine that? Because that really is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are playing instruments which are unique to them And maybe they're not even playing repertoire. Maybe they're playing music which they themselves have created. And for music consultant David Ashworth, Charlotte's performance could be just the beginning. I've been working in special schools where I've seen young people making music using assistive technology. And it's always tended to be making music in its own terms, in its own style, if you like. A lot of improvisation and um, a lot of of fairly cutting-edge avant-garde sort of sounds, if you like. What makes Charlotte different is she was actually playing crotchets and quavers. She was playing the dots, if you like. She was playing a mainstream piece of music, which is you normally associate as being accessed by 
if you like, a mainstream musician. And that was what was different. She actually had the, the audacity, if you like, to actually step into their world. And um, that was what made it so significant, I think. Where Charlotte has been important, she's been a catalyst, if you like, to get this debate really going. And I'm sure she will see it in that way and feel rightly proud of that achievement. <laughs> Charlotte White chose to pursue her academic studies and gained a place at university studying social policy and criminology. Advancements in the availability and price of software, though, mean she may soon return to music. And for Doug Bott, that moment can't come soon enough. I mean, as a, as a composer, she was very instinctive. She's extraordinary in terms of the fact that she, she has a really innate musical ability. I think that any music teacher or music educator who had come across her, whether she was a disabled person or not, would find her to be an outstanding student in terms of the way that she engages with learning, practicing and performing musical instruments, and in terms of the way that she engages with composition and the fact that it really comes from inside her rather than from her understanding of the rules of music. Music inspired me in the belief that I could achieve anything and a new belief in myself which had pretty much gone for the most part and that belief became sort of lit in every part of my life. It became lit like my physiotherapy, my occupational therapy, my speech therapy. I became more enthusiastic and had much more of a drive to achieve which I had slightly lost before then. And I did start achieving in all those areas much more than I had done. And wanting to break the barriers and do the same things as everyone else was, rather than just being bracketed as a disabled person who wouldn't achieve. I got ambition back of what I wanted to achieve in the future in the complete long run. I started to enjoy life as well and have fun and start to experience things that the average teenager does. Charlotte White's musical flight was presented by Josie Darby and produced in Bristol by Toby Field. All the music in the programme was either composed or performed by Charlotte.